going to mug me. I'm not going to mug you. Is that gorgeous or what, eh? And I believe I can run the Peace and Marathon. Download Veeley now. Our nation hasn't just been built by the leading figures of the day who go down in the history books, but by a vast army of workers of all ages dedicated to doing some really horrific jobs. This time, why the royal succession relied on women with cricket bats, how carrying the king's vital messages could be a painful business, and why the very symbol of monarchy meant working with rotten shellfish. <laughs> Welcome to the worst royal jobs in history. at work and at play. In the medieval world, the king sat at the top of the orders of chivalry. Sports like jousting proclaimed their status as war leader and perfect gentleman. But in order for the king and his barons to show off without killing each other, scores of men were employed in the thankless task of making the ultimate throwaway designer object. The ruling classes charging full tilt at each other in order to knock each other onto the ground was just a bit of sport. The real bad job was reserved for the bloke who made this, the lance that you used in the tournament. Mind you, he didn't make just one, he made loads. Why so many, Toby? Well, the thing about jousting is the object is to hit your opponent as hard as possible. And when you have trained people doing that, they're going to be hitting each other regularly and they're going to be hitting with such force that they're going to break their lances. Skilled lance makers had to make sure their weapons shattered on impact, vital when royal safety was at stake. So someone like Henry VIII would have dressed up in the armour and done all this? Yes, Henry VIII himself was a very, very enthusiastic jouster, uh, so much so that uh, his courtiers often tried to dissuade him from it. He was nearly killed in a joust in 1524. He was so excited by the event that he charged off without lowering his visor. And his opponent, who couldn't see very well, couldn't really see what was going on. And Henry was struck right above the eye. And the lance broke and splinters flew into the king's face. And he was within inches of death. It was extraordinary that he wasn't even hurt, actually. So how many might these guys have had to make? Well, we do know in 1403 there's a record of a lance maker supplying 171 lances for a tournament in Spain. And if you have a large tournament with 60 or 100 knights competing, that's a lot of lances they're going to be going through. Light, beautifully decorated, superbly balanced, and gone in a second. The lance maker's job was so underrated that the very technology for making them has been lost. We've had to get a master carpenter to work out how it was done. Jerry, tell me that these things are easy to make. If only they were. I've spent a week now trying to work out the way they made them. I think I've got there now. I think I've got there. I've nearly lost a leg, but I think I've got there. And you were using language I'd hardly ever heard before. Um, language I haven't used for a long time. So tell me how this thing is Well, made. basically, what we've got, we've got a tree. Yeah. First of all, we square it off. And I'm using a side axe. Now, if you look at that, you'll find there's one side is flat, one side's curved. And it's basically for just taking away the timber, and making lots of small cuts, along and then a couple of long sweeping cuts and as you can see it's beginning to square up already there would you like to have a go yeah and um, you've got to remember this is going to be done on four sides if you do that for two hours i'll go around here two hours Blimey. and after two hours yeah. it should look something like this which we then with the draw knife trim down for another three or four hours 
And once we've got it to this sort of size, we take the scrapers and finish them off so that we get a nice round shaft. One oh, pile of wood chips oh. later, I naively assumed I'd done the most boring part. Have we finished it? No, not quite. What are we going to do? We've still got the handle to do. When do we do that? Over on the pole lathe. That's this thing. That's the thing machine over there. If you've ever pumped up a car tyre with a foot pump, you'll know that just a few minutes is exhausting. And we're relying on good old leg power here. Right, would you like to have a go? I'm left-handed. I have to. So go am I. Oh, I know that's all right. <laughs> I'll come round this side. All right. Forget five minutes. Each handle took a good three hours to make. We'll make a pole chair of you yet. I'll tell you what, it doesn't take long before your leg starts to ache, does it? That's it. But there again, you end up with one really big fine. You get the idea. With nothing to occupy your mind except the screaming ache in your leg, this is incredibly monotonous work. But you have to keep alert. As the pole gets thinner, there's a danger that it will snap, causing terrible injuries. But after two days scraping and chipping, there's no thanks, and about as much job satisfaction as making teapots out of chocolate. Now that is such a frustrating sight. It must have been part of the status for the nobles to destroy something that looks so good. But imagine what it must have been like for the lance maker, not only to see this beautiful thing trashed, but trashed at about 35 miles an hour in about five seconds flat. Mind you, that's not all. After the tournament came the battle and the jobs just got worse and worse. For centuries, being a king meant going to war. There were wars to win the throne, wars to defend it, wars with foreign powers. Medieval kings really fought, and seven of them died on the battlefield. So it was vital to the defence of the realm that the king had the very best armour. Chain mail was the business. Solid but flexible. So the real architects of royal power from Hastings to Agincourt were the poor souls who had to knit these coats out of thousands of bits of wire. It's not hard to imagine the downside of being a link maker. The fact is it was incredibly laborious and uh, repetitive work. It involved cutting thousands and thousands of rings and linking them together one by one. The problem was it was very dangerous in the sense that you'd often get lacerations from the rusty metal which you're playing with. Uh, infection can, can get in, uh, tetanus, all those lovely things which uh, we don't have to live with today, luckily. So what do we do when we finish that? Well, once we've clipped this off, we've got a little coil. And next step in the process, we need to go over to a little work plate. Yep. So first wind your wire into a long rings. coil. I've got a special set of crimping tools here, which have a tiny little hole set about two mil in, which is just over the width of the wire. Yeah. Then cut and the coil into single overlapped wire rings. An overlapped ring. Heat and soften and the rings in a fire an hour until so, cherry and red. They're beautiful cherry red, but they will cool quite quickly. Stage four, this is hammer out the rings to make a single flat overlapped nice link. So give it a tap, two, three of those. And you can see that the ring is now flattened. Now it comes much more arduous because... And now uh, these we flat overlapped pieces have to be riveted together for strength. Right through that. So what you need to do is place the ring just over that hole. You know what I'm worried about? If I miss this little hole with my tool, I could mess up your tool, couldn't I? You give it a good solid whack. There you go. Uh, yep. Now gone you've gone a bit far. too far there. I've messed it up, haven't I? Yeah, that's not gone through and the rings split apart. So can we use yours, because I'm... Yeah, sure. ...terrified <laughs> I might die of boredom otherwise. OK. Little triangular rivet here. And what we're going to do is force the little rivet into the hole which we've made. So why was this job so important to the king? Well, the provision of good quality armour to the armed forces was integral to the security of the country and uh, ultimately the security of the monarchy. So he would have wanted his men to have the best quality stuff he could possibly afford. So no male, no king? Pretty much, you got it. Yeah. Yeah, some people might say it's <laughs> quite a good thing. And we're going to set it by squeezing it with these pliers and giving a good hammer strike on top. 
And there you have it, one highly durable, solid steel mail riveted ring, which makes up one of the many on this uh, hauberk just over here. There are something like 30,000 rings on this, aren't there? So just another 29,999 and we'll have made a complete mail shirt. To do that, each ring has to be riveted through its neighbour to make a strong and supple suit, an incredibly laborious process. So there was plenty of work for link makers who were apprenticed at age 12 and had to settle for working long, boring hours without pay. If I'm the king, I want some more mail, I want to commission you to make it, yeah. and I want it tomorrow, right. can you do it for me? Uh, very unlikely, unless you've got a workforce of maybe 100 men or so, because the king is going to have the very best mail available, and it's going to be very fine stuff, much smaller than the rings we're actually using here. I've got one example here, a bronze ring, which you can see is about a third of the size of the ones we're going to be working with. There are shirts which have in excess of 200,000 rings and are so dense that you can't even force a needle through it. But even when they weren't using their costly chain mail in battle, medieval monarchs had plenty of other ways of keeping themselves at the top of the tree. This is King Harold in the Bayer Tapestry. And that's not a mutant duck he's holding, but one of the most expensive status symbols in history. A falcon. Hunting wasn't just a sport for the monarchy, it was an essential way of showing who was boss. Whole areas like the New Forest were reserved just for the king, and there were even rules about which ranks could use which sort of hawk. Imagine trying to keep a living Lamborghini with feathers happy and you'll see what was at stake for the royal falconry. Jay, we're out in the country with these fantastic birds. Why was falconry such a bad job? Well, because they were so fantastic. I mean, if you were to lose one of these, you were in so much trouble. These birds are worth a fortune, worth more than a lot of the other hunting assets of the royal families. So, for example, Philip the Bold, son, was captured during one of the Crusades. His ransom was 200,000 golden ducats, but that was declined for just 12 geo falcons instead. So they're so valuable that should you lose one of these, you were in real, real trouble. This part of the job doesn't seem great. No, you as a cadge man had to carry these royal falcons into the field for the royalty. A cadge man, a the cadger. Ca the cadger, it's where you get the phrase cadger lift from. You had to carry these through all terrain, crossing rivers, in the worst areas of the country, and possibly in quite bad climatic conditions. And would there normally have been about this number of birds? Well, you're looking at planes? four on this particular cadge, but you could have been carrying 12, even more than that. And each bird weighing between one and a half to two pounds in weight, of course, is going to weigh the old codger down. So if I lose one of these, I'm in big trouble. I have to carry this cage around with me all the time. What else? Well... You would have to make sure that you recovered the hawks, crossing icy streams, risking life and limb to recover the bird, should it chase and kill something. Should you not be able to recover the trained hawk, of course, that hawk, or one like it, once finally recovered, would remove six ounces of flesh from your breast. Oh, great. The punishment of having a hamburger-sized piece of your body eaten by the bird would alone make this a worse job. But the terror started early, at the age of seven. Their first job was to tame down a wildly trapped hawk. So they not only had this huge bird on their hand, but they had a very angry bird with them as well. What are we going to do now? Well, we're going to give this guy his daily exercise. The falconer had to exercise his hawks every day, as well as the normal management of feeding, cleaning, look after them. The hawk was the priority. That came first above everything else. You feel a nice bit of breeze there, his wings come out, and we'll let him off. Exercising a falcon requires a bit more skill than walking a dog. You have to swing a baited lure just out of reach of a bird flying at 30 or 40 miles an hour. Wow! But the rigorous <laughs> job spec also nice involves touch. personal qualities. Back in the late 13th century, Aliard wrote that a falconer had to be sober, patient, chaste, sweet-smelling, and avoiding preoccupations. Chaste as in not sleeping with people? Very much so. 
because sleeping with a local prostitute could lead to disease which could be passed on to the falcons themselves. Thus encouraged to think I was perfectly cut out for the job, it's my turn to put the birds through their paces. So, I mean, how hard could it be to swing my bit of swing. meat on the end of a There's string? If at any time you're not sure... Oh, gee! <laughs> That's more that was it. very, very scary. You are so clever. Oh, does that count? She caught she it. She caught it. In one. You're swinging the lure the wrong way. It will be forward at the bottom. Oh, forward at the bottom. That's what I've done wrong. So. Oh, oh, so I, put, I tried to put it behind end. my back to readjust it. She just followed it behind my back and went down and got it. You are some smart bird. A falcon hunt was a great social occasion. But all the training was for nothing if you couldn't keep up with the royals as they hunted rabbit and wildfowl. Remember, the royal party are mounted on horseback. These guys are being followed by you on foot. So you've got to be up the hills and over the dales, through the bramble bushes, through the briars, across streams, the risk of drowning, anything to recover your hawk and the quarry that it's taken. So, Blade, oh, you've seen something, yep, you see yep. something? Yep. there. Yep. Oh my God. This proves that falconers were brave and resolute and hunted their quarry until they were able to get it. These waders are leaking, Jay. It's freezing in here. I'm glad I'm not just in tights and a jerkin and bare feet. I think I'm going to let it have it. <laughs> the court has always been vital to the smooth running of the monarchy. By the 16th century, it was a vast community of unseen workers of all ranks, catering for every whim of the autocratic Tudors. The present queen has downsized her staff to 645 people, poor thing. But in Tudor times, the monarch had over a thousand courtiers and over a thousand servants. And each one knew their place in the pecking order, even if it was quite a lowly one. Like the whipping boy, who was an aristocratic friend of the royal prince, and it was his job to receive punishment every time the heir to the throne did something wrong. And if you think that's unfair, just look at the demands that were made on some of the rest of the staff. All right, we'll stop now. The court was a place of intrigue. One group of luckless servants had the job of risking their lives to protect the monarch from plotting courtiers. A royal meal had anything up to 25 dishes. Any one of them could contain something deadly. And what better way to climb the slippery pole than to poison the food of the person that you're eating with? Hence the job of royal food taster, which is enough to put you off your food for life, isn't it, Cassie? Absolutely. But surely it must have been a pretty easy job. I mean, once there was poison in your food, well, you'd eat it and know straight away, wouldn't you? Not necessarily. How come? Because it's remarkably easy to hide something that's deadly dangerous in food and it would not be obvious to you until you had already eaten it. What's this stuff? This stuff's called frumenty. Which is what? A sort of thick grain. Like a sort of porridge or something? A very thick porridge, yeah. All right, so how am I going to poison this? Ah, well, you could do that easily with a solid poison like arsenic or mercury. Have we got any arsenic? We do indeed. This is arsenic. It's not real arsenic, is it? No, it's not. It's plaster of Paris. <laughs> So what are we going to do with it? We are going to mix it with the frumenty, tea, but yeah. because it's so solid and white, it will be quite obvious. So yeah. first, we'll mix it up with a bit of water. Were the royals really under threat of being poisoned, or was it just paranoia? Uh, there was a great deal of paranoia, but there were actual plots to poison the royals. Yes. Like what? Well, in the 1590s, there was a plot allegedly by the King of Spain to poison Queen Elizabeth. The Spanish government managed to find three Portuguese men who would agree to poison the Queen. One of these three was her own physician, Dr. Rodrigo Lopez, who'd been living in London for decades. But the plot was betrayed, the three were tortured and confessed, 
and of course as traitors condemned to death and executed horribly, hanged, drawn and quartered. Now, if I was a really subtle food taster, how am I going to be able to tell that there's poison there? The first thing you're going to notice is a very strange grittiness. But it's not going to be so strange that you're going to feel, I shouldn't eat this. You'll swallow it. And what's it going to do to me? Oh, that's appalling. The first thing you're going to feel is a sort of burning. Not necessarily strong, but something going on in the mouth. If you've got an empty stomach, within an hour you're going to start vomiting uncontrollably. You're going to have extreme pains in the stomach area. It feels like rats gnawing on your insides. And then after about an hour, perhaps two, you're going to start suffering from purging, which is a polite way of saying... That's enough. So Elizabeth I was paranoid. She saw poison everywhere. Every dish was tested before she ate. Even her gloves and handkerchiefs were checked in case they'd been impregnated with something nasty. And it was her disposable servants who were put in the front line. The raw food taster comes into the room. Is there any ceremony? There is, yes. The ladies in waiting would come and, and begin the ceremony by laying the table. And then the men would bring each dish from the kitchen and lay it on the table. And the ladies in waiting would supervise. Each person who'd brought a dish was then required to eat one bite from the dish that he had carried. And when this ceremony was complete, and there might be as many as 20 or 25 dishes, then it was safe for the monarch to eat from these dishes. Remember, this is a time of invasion, potential invasion by the Spanish. The monarch embodied all that was England and thus had to be kept completely safe. You had to have food tasters. So being a royal food taster wasn't bad because you were actually going to die. It's just that you were terrified you were going to die. Yeah, that's about it. Well, this food is still pretty good. Potentially dangerous. <laughs> Elizabeth's court didn't have a permanent address. To ensure the loyalty of her subjects and to save on housekeeping, the Queen went walkabout, and the whole court went with her. In the summer of 1578, they plonked themselves on 25 different households, saving the equivalent of £10,000 per day. It may have been a good deal for the Queen, but for the men and women of the court, it was like moving house every day, and the biggest load was literally on the shoulders of the groom of the chamber. And I don't just mean one or two carts. We're talking two or three hundred, and everything in them had to be offloaded and got into the staying house on time and in order, ready for the Queen's arrival. So if you were the groom of the chamber, you had to be something like a cross between Paul Burrell and Arnold Schwarzenegger, which isn't a very attractive image really, is it? Summer tours or progresses would last 8 to 12 weeks, and each stay needed days of preparation. When Queen Elizabeth II goes off on a royal tour, it's all pretty relaxed. She just has oh, the odd bit of red carpet and uh, the occasional five-star hotel and a private jet or two. But Queen Elizabeth I was much more demanding. The groom of the chamber had to take out of her palace all of the Queen's necessary possessions. That meant not only the furniture and the carpets, but the pictures and the wall hangings and her jewellery, her legal documents. And the Queen was renowned for having quite a temper on her. So if you wanted to avoid her wrath, you had to have great big muscles and patience and a phenomenally good memory. Simon Bowyer, who organised the tour in 1578, had all those qualities. At the Mutus estate, he spent two days setting up with his team, only for the Queen to change her mind after staying for dinner and set off for another location. Add to this indecisiveness Elizabeth's bouts of toothache, and the groom of the chamber had the boss from hell. She wasn't much of a guest either. 
So not everyone was that happy about having to lay out the old red carpet. In fact, there was an estate called Gotham Place where they were so worried about the possible expense and hassle of having a royal progress that they decided they'd try and put the Queen off by all collectively feigning a kind of madness. So the royal progress turns up and all the aristocrats and servants there suddenly go, and the progress all run away absolutely terrified. Although I suspect that the groom of the chamber had a bit of a smile on his face when he left. The groom may have ended up with a strained back and frayed nerves, but at least he had a roof over his head. Not all royal employees were as lucky. With the court moving around so much, communication became vital to the institution of the monarchy, hence the job of royal messenger. But, um, the royal messenger was important not just simply in order to tell people where the king and queen were at any particular moment in time, but also to let them know about royal births and deaths and married marriages and much darker things like uh, intrigues and stabbings and assassinations. Anything you wanted to know, the royal messenger would let you know it. Come on. Come on. Henry VIII started a system of messengers that rode between staging posts. In time it became the Royal Postal Service, which is why the monarch's head is still on stamps. But for early messengers, every journey was tough and fraught with danger. When Elizabeth I died, it was Royal Messenger Sir Robert Carey who rode to Scotland to tell James, the heir to the throne, he was now king. Riding in all weathers, he also had to avoid potential assassination from those who wanted to delay news of the Queen's death. The Marshal met me coming and bade me be gone, for he had learned for certain they would betray me. <laughs> Wind, rain, 200 miles and people waiting to kill me. I can't wait. But Sir Robert had to press on, because for the royal family, succession is vital. The whole institution is based on births, deaths, and conceptions. Was the Queen going to have a baby? Was it the King's? The evidence was going to be right here among the royal sheets. And one of the people who would have known most about it was a worse jobber. Not an aristocrat, but the person round the back mopping up after all this messy business the royal washerwoman. But being a royal washerwoman was tough, messy, oh, stuck on me. so surprisingly oh, dangerous. You can see why so very many women die drowning, can't you? Oh, die oh. drowning? Yeah, huge cause of death amongst Elizabethan women. Oh. Falling in wells, slipping in ponds, all that sort of thing, whilst you're busy bucket after bucket after bucket and you get tireder and tireder. Especially sort of near dinner time when everybody's tired. There's a sort of, when you look at the coroner's reports, there's a sort of blip and, you know, just before dinner. Yeah. It's difficult to go. imagine just how tough the women had to be. Uh -huh. All the water had to be lugged from the moat oh, before the washing could begin. Here, I think, just inside whoa. The... Whoa, whoa, don't spill it now. <laughs> Lovely. That's great. Right. There was no I'm soap powder, down. just water well, repeatedly do. strained well, through wood ash to make really, lye. It's... It contains the, the chemical, the alkali, which is what dissolves the grease. So presumably it's not too good on your hands? It's terrible on your hands. Water? Yes. So it's going to pick up all the chemicals out of the ash and then the hay and the gravel will strain it, act as a filter. So what comes out the bottom should be quite clean looking, shouldn't look ashy at all. Oh, it's coming out now, isn't it? Yeah, it is. It's starting to flow. It's a little through. bit muddy. Dirty sheets next. In the big... Bucking basket, but that's it. Loose the smelly sheets we were then put into a bucking no. basket, in the, the very bucket first basket top there. loader. Well, they're usually married women, actually, which is quite interesting because it's about the only job of any decent sort of remuneration that married women could do. Do we know anything about any of them? We've got a few 
names of people who were royal laundresses. Anne Twist, for example, she was um, Queen Elizabeth's laundress for oh, 16, 17 years. And there was a, an Anne Harris as well in King Henry VIII's reign, who held the post for some time. They were quite poorly paid, but they were, had to be respectable women. I mean, you wouldn't want just anybody touching all your linens and your personal stuff, would you? Well, then presumably, the, uh, the washerwomen would have known more about the sex lives of the monarchy than anybody else. <laughs> yeah, I think they probably would, actually. They're pretty darn intimate thing sheets, aren't they? You can't get away with anything. In fact, there's even proof of that. Um, the sort of, like, foreign ambassadors at Elizabeth's court, when she was sort of beginning to get on and a bit long in the tooth, and they were contemplating the French marriage with the Duke of Anjou, they were actually paid washerwomen for inside information as to whether she was still menstruating or not. Oh, <laughs> what do we do with this? this? I'm going to lift it up on there. Yeah. OK. Oh, I'm flipping it. And now? Uh, now we pour the lye that we made through the linen. And sort of like a liquid soap, it'll move through and... You'd have to have been quite tough, wouldn't you, to yeah. have been a washerwoman? Oh, you had to have muscles, there's no doubt about it. It's nothing sissy about this job. <laughs> Now what? Right, well, we just let that trickle through slowly. We don't want to hurry it particularly. It's going to be dissolving any grease that's in there. Yeah. Um, and then we're going to beat the living daylights out of it. <laughs> These are called battle doors, not bats. But this feels very much like a strenuous version of cricket. If you weren't so knackered after the water carrying and butt loading, it would be a way of venting your frustration at the job. Hang on a sec. Give it a dunk. Awesome. Oh, God, look at that. Five minutes. It must have been really cracked and bleeding I there, Harris. It must have been there. cracked and bleeding. Honestly, the time. Right, do you want to wring this one out? Yep. Or if you grab one end and I'll grab the other. Yep. The sign of every <laughs> birth, death, and marriage is going to be in here, isn't yeah. it? Yeah. Should we hang this out? Yeah, that's a good idea. For drying, they used privets rather than pegs and washing lines. But if the wind got up and blew the sheets into the mud, the washerwoman would have to start all over again. I got a great fall, by the way, and my horse, with one of his heels, gave me a blow on the head that made me shed much blood. We hadn't meant to recreate every bit of Robert Carey's journey. Hello. But then... ceremony have always been a way of establishing royal status. But before the days of amplified music and RAF flypasts, there was no more spectacular way of celebrating a victory or coronation than a royal firework display. Thanks to Handel's music for the royal fireworks, it's George II's magnificent firework displays that are so well remembered. But behind all the oohs and the ahs and the big bangs lies another worst job that involves blood and burns and physical injury. Welcome to the highly explosive career of the fireworker. Making and firing fireworks was a very primitive business. There was only one colour, no safety awareness, and it involved playing around with large quantities of gunpowder in small pieces of paper. If I was a really daft fireworker, yeah. what kind of things might I have done to cause an explosion? Well, you could, and I've got to illustrate this, you could be doing this in front of your fireworks. People really smoked They smoked, sparks came out, accident report actually shows that people were smoking, making fireworks. Right, Daryl? As soon as I've got this pipe in my mouth, show me what I might have done, all right? Ah, hey! That was so hot. I can tell you we were, what, 10 metres away, and you really felt it, didn't you? Wow, and lots of little bits of stuff in my eyes as well. <laughs> I wish I hadn't done that. <laughs> <laughs> Presumably there must have been more to their fireworks than just a long line of gunpowder. Oh, of course, yes. Rockets are basically flying fountains. Um, of course, you would have had problems with rockets because they used to fire them horizontally. Rockets coming out horizontally? Yeah. Well, that was bad for the audience because they weren't necessarily lined up 
like that, they would have been sometimes around and therefore the audience got the rocket, but then of course so did the people firing. They would have um, got a, a lot of other problems as well. There were lots of explosions, people would get them through their clothes because they weren't wearing appropriate clothing. John, this looks like the kind of bomb that the Roadrunner has. Indeed, in the times that we're talking about, the 18th century, uh, they were called balloons. Balloons. I can see we're going to do something dangerous with it, whatever you call it. it it's a dangerous firework. Don't knock down the mortar because one of these days it's going to have a shell in it. Were there many injuries from these things? Oh, there were loads of injuries, yes. You can imagine if one of these actually explodes within a metal mortar like that, you've got shrapnel flying about. Do we know very much about the people who were hurt? We don't know anything about them. They were killed and the whole thing was hushed up. Oh, really? Yeah. In fact, in one display, four people were killed. They just carried on the display. Where were these things fired from? A lot of displays in the 18th century would have used water as a backdrop. And actually, barges would have contained all these mortars. And there'd have been a bloke on there lighting them? There would have been more than one bloke on there lighting them. If one of them actually went, you got big trouble because the whole of the barge goes and the men end up in the water. Well, I'm glad we're on dry land. What do I do? Just lower it in? Just lower it in, but keep your head away yeah. and try and keep your hands as far away as possible. Yeah. This was a job no one wanted to do. So the Royal Fireworkers were volunteered right. from the lowest ranks of the military. And with burns to the skin, perforated eardrums and deaths, they didn't just put the one in and go home. Way! The most dangerous part was reloading. Oh, that was amazing, wasn't it? The worst thing is that there are probably burning embers in the bottom there. So, so I've got to put a whole load of this stuff in. Another load of gunpowder and you've got to put the shell back in. And they really did that? And they really did that. With the embers in? With the embers in. Even George II's firework displays didn't go without a hitch. The King had forked out £8,000, about a million today. With a crowd of 12,000 people waiting, the decorated frame holding the fireworks caught fire. The designer wasn't happy. This fireworker ended up with a sword at his throat. By the 1900s, the political power of the royals had eroded, but show was as important to them as ever. They were still the people to know, sharing their lavish lifestyle with their favourite movers and shakers. An invite to one of Edward VII's shooting parties at Sandringham was the ultimate social accolade, and every guest wanted to look their very best. Which brings me to my next worst job, which is very much at the bottom of the pecking order, literally below stairs. It's the boot boy. Edward loved shooting, and he worked his guests hard. They'd spend long days blasting away at wildlife before returning late for a lavish dinner, port, cigars and bed. As the snores broke out over Sandringham, the Royal Boot Boys Day was only just beginning. And it was up to the poor old boot boy to creep around the corridors last thing at night, collecting up everyone's boots and shoes and then polishing them so they'd be bright and shiny for the hunt the next morning. And given that King Edward insisted that the entire hunting party should be up at the crack of dawn and everyone had to set their alarms really early, the poor old boot boys hardly got any sleep at all. So Edward VII's upstairs, he's brought his full hunting party with him. How much work is that going to be for me, the boot boy? A horrific amount of work. When the hunting was going on, Chaps like you really did have a rough life. Right, I've got the shoelaces out. What next? You've got to learn how to make your own blacking. If you come round here, yep. I'm going to read you Mrs Beaton's uh, re recipe for blacking. Are you ready? Yep. Take four ounces of ivory black. God, that looks good stuff. <laughs> uh, then an ounce of olive oil. How many of these am I putting in? The well, grim side of this job wasn't pounds. just terrible tiredness, really but also mixing up some pretty foul and caustic ingredients, oh, God, which could be mess. deadly. 
<laughs> we got an ounce of sulfuric acid. You just want to be very careful. I think I better do this for you. That's Hold your nose. Yeah. <laughs> oh, <laughs> we're gonna die! Oh, <coughs> rotten eggs. You didn't bet. <laughs> oh. How much did they get paid? About eight pounds a year, which wasn't very much. But then they did get their keep. So most of that eight pounds, their mother would expect them to bring back home to them on their monthly day off. Always be good to your mum. In times of earlier monarchs, working for the king or queen could bring you riches. But by the 20th century, back-breaking royal domestic service wasn't even well paid. By Edward VII's time, most young men at that time didn't want to go into domestic service. They wanted to go into something much more glamorous and manly, like the army, and march out to the colonies in their red coats. So domestic service was beginning to be really looked down on. So when you did get your very rare days off, you'd go out there and people would jeer at you, rather, for coming from a house rather than coming from some job in the new industries that were growing up. It's a pretty scant reward for doing all this work, but nevertheless, it's enough to get the boots polished. I'm rather proud of that, even if they do stink of sugar. <laughs> and it didn't stop at hunting boots. There were all the party shoes to shine as well. By the time those were done, the hunter's boots were back again. But at least one of my jobs had an end to it. What with all the falls and the ambushes, not to mention losing my lovely hat and having to ride about 200 miles just to deliver a simple message, that job is frightening, dangerous, not to say very, very tedious. But my very worst royal job is also extremely disgusting. Oh, and now, of course, I've got to ride all the way back again. Come on, Poppy, off we go. I've been looking at the worst jobs that supported the monarchy down the centuries. But which one was the very worst job? Moving house for Elizabeth I was back-breaking, but pretty well paid. Fireworking was fun, so long as you remembered to keep your head out of the way. Whoa, blimey! And even royal falconers had a family firm to support them when they were old codgers. Oh, does that count? No, for me, the very worst job of all is an incredibly disgusting and very ancient one, and one that underlies the very symbol of royalty itself, the purple maker. Purple has been the colour of royalty since Roman emperors because it's so difficult and expensive to make. I am a purple maker's assistant and this is the worst job that disappeared during the siege of Constantinople when all the purple makers were wiped out. So we reckon that this is the first time in over 500 years that this particular process has been demonstrated, don't we, Jim? Yeah, that's quite true. Yes. And one of the shortcomings of television is that you can't smell the incredible niff that's coming off this rather disgusting mess. Why are we killing all these innocent shellfish? <laughs> Well, this, Tony, is the basis of the, of the whole of the uh, imperial purple industry. This was the dye, the most prestigious dye in, 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 uh, in the world, in fact. The Romans, of course, made it an imperial monopoly, and this went on right into the Middle Ages, in actual fact. So how do you make it out of these things? Yes, well, basically, we have the, the, the mollus, this is the, the uh, murex trunculus, and what we have to do is to make an incision into what, in fact, is the hypobranchial gland, um, and... When we've done that, uh, the, the, the dye or the precursor comes out and the air, in fact, oxidises it uh, to the purple pigment. Uh, but, of course, the, the old dyes had to do this on a vast scale and uh, this involved, in fact... Oh! <laughs> now, I really didn't to... know you were going to do that. <laughs> don't hit it too hard, otherwise yeah. you get all the entrails over the floor. Yeah, don't tell me, it was you who so, whacked it. Uh, that's the technique. Yeah. So uh, We'll have to work through these. I've kept these on one side. Uh, I've done those for you previously. I don't want to hear yeah, that. Hard. That's the idea. Smashing a few stinking shellfish is stomach turning expect. enough, but the purple makers had to smash at least a thousand to dye just one cloak. 
I can understand why only royalty could afford it. <laughs> and put them into the pot. God, doesn't it affect you? Well, no, perhaps I'm used to it. <laughs> there we are, some more over there. We, those we did earlier, of course. So now these will be put into the water, and then eventually, to get the actual dye, it takes about 10 days fermentation. Come on. Like this. That's it. this is in order to extract the dye or rather the pigment yep. f from the uh, macerated mollusks. How much water do you want? Uh, that's about right. Yep. Mm -hmm. Then the dye will. Now stand for an out. hour or two so, to collect yeah, pigment can, yeah. in liquid, add wood ash for its alkali, and leave the putrefying shellfish to we, rot. We leave and some of the mollusks for really, 10 in, whole fact, days. in the pot because we want it to ferment. And so that's what we've got here. Yeah. Now you notice we have a lid on it. Why is uh, that? Well basically we want to keep it in the dark. Uh, otherwise what happens is that the, the light in fact can, can, can uh, break the dye down to what we call debrominate it. In other words we take the redness out and we end up with a blue. So we can end up with this colour as opposed to that one. How do we know when this is ready? And this will be tested in fact either by, by the feel, which feels slippery, or by the taste. And this is shellfish that have been fermenting for 10 days. Exactly, yep. <coughs> oh, wow, that was bad out there. This is powerful stuff. That is really it? disgusting. Yeah. And what happens when you feel it? What do you, uh, if it feels feel? slippery, th this gives an idea of the degree of, of alkalinity. Mm. If it was acid, it would be rougher. That's the technique. Oh. And then they really tasted and, it. And the other way is to taste it, in fact. It's, <laughs> I don't know. It's rather powerful. I don't know what it tasted like. It's just the thought, really. It's so disgusting. Only having done the fermented mollusk taste test, is it now time to put the cloth in the vat, lid firmly back on? So we should leave, leave it really for half an hour or so to um, to pick up the dye. I'll leave it till I'm dead, if you like. Mm. Oh, that was an adventure. Blimey. And after half an hour, it's time to expose the cloth to the air and see if it's worked. Oh, look! Wow. That's really changing fast, isn't it? So when it comes out of the, the vat, uh, it takes usually a couple of minutes. It goes a greeny colour and then slowly turns the purple colour, as you can see. Look at that now. Isn't that fantastic? We've really proved the process works. So the lives of all these poor little foul-smelling shellfish weren't sacrificed in vain. And if it hadn't been for all the stirring and the bubbling and the feeling and the tasting, then our royals would never have been swathed in all this kind of stuff. They'd have been dressed in fuchsia pink or lime green. Join me next time when I'll be down the bottom of the careers barrel again, scraping up some more worse jobs. Next time I'm on my knees down a mine as a child harrier. Up in the air, finding out what it took to make Brunel's reputation. And on my back, keeping the whole industrial revolution moving.